built during the naval arms race between Greece and the Ottoman Empire. She would have been the most powerful battleship in the Eastern Mediterranean. But with the outbreak of the First World War and the loss of the German Empire, she was left unfinished for over a decade. Why? Well, my name's James Phillips and in this video I'm going to tell you the story of the never finished battleship Salamis. To understand her story, we have to look back to the closing stages of the 19th century. What happened was, tensions between Greece and the Ottomans were building, to a point where war broke out in 1897. With the commencement of what would be called the Greco-Ottoman War, the Greco-Turkish War, or also known as the Thirty Day War. Now, this saw the Ottomans claim victory and they seized a small portion of the Thessaly region of Greece, which at the time bordered Ottoman-controlled Balkans. Now granted, this all started from Greece assisting in helping insurgents on the island of Crete, who were opposed to Ottoman rule, but I'm not going to go into that much detail, because there is a pinned video which actually gives a better and comprehensive breakdown of the entire conflict. So looking at the end of that conflict, what was the major takeaways? So it proved that Greece was the superior naval force in the Aegean Sea, whereas on land the Ottomans were the superior force. They were better trained, disciplined and better organised, and this was because some friendly Germans were on a military mission to the Ottoman Empire and they were giving them a few tips and tricks of actually how to have a fully functional army that could win a war. After the end of what was called the 30 Day War, there was a ceasefire, which lasted until September 30th, 1897, where the Treaty of Constantinople was signed, ending all hostilities between Greece and the Ottoman Empire. This in turn gave the Ottomans the chance to take a seriously good look at their navy, and it is about time, as on their rosters, they were fielding two screw ships of the line, one screw frigate, 18 ironclads, comprising of three classes of broadside ironclad, three central battery ironclads, and one armoured ram, 16 wooden hulled corvettes, one unprotected cruiser, four barbette battery ironclads, one coast defence turret ship, four casement ironclads, six river monitors, eight third-class torpedo boats, seven normal torpedo boats, and two Nordenfeldt submarines. But these were classed as not battle-capable due to range, speed, and their stability. Now across the Aegean Sea, the Royal Hellenic Navy was fielding three to four ironclads, of which three were the Hydro class, as you can see on screen now. One unprotected cruiser, one vintage sail frigate, 25 torpedo boats, one sloop, and 14 gunboats. Now looking at it this way, the Ottomans had more ships on their roster, however operational vessels is a completely different ball game, and one that I am unable to ascertain the exact number. However, as you can see, the Ottomans had some pretty old ships in their roster with wooden hulled screw ships of the line, a screw frigate, and multiple wooden hulled corvettes. It was definitely time for a major modernisation of the fleet. Modernisation would come in naval programmes, aimed at modernising their fleet to be comparable with their neighbours Greece. The first vessels ordered would be the protected cruiser Missidier from the USA, ordered in 1900. Hamidier would be ordered from the UK, also in 1900. Then two Pekki Sivket class torpedo cruisers, ordered from Germany in 1903. And finally, one Drama class protected cruiser from Italy. Messidier would be laid down in November 1901 and commissioned into the fleet in December 1903. Hamidier would be laid down in April 1902 
launched in late September 1903 and commissioned into the Ottoman Navy in April 1904. The two Pekir Cat class were laid down in February 1906 and being launched in November and December 1906 respectively. Both would be commissioned in 1907. Now finally, the cruiser Drama was an Italian copy of the Hamadier and she was laid down in 1907. But during construction, the Ottomans refused to pay because of their foreign debts, so work was halted. But Italy seized the ship after the commencement of the Italo-Ottoman War. Ironically, the Ottomans couldn't keep their noses out of conflict during the first half of the 1900s. So, in essence, out of five cruisers ordered, they would only get four. Now, across the Aegean Sea, the Greeks could see exactly what the Ottomans were planning, and they would need to respond if they were to keep the naval superiority over the Ottomans in the Aegean. In 1908, Vickers of Barrow, England, offered a 4,000 ton battleship design, called Zine 375, which would have been 387 feet long and armed with four 10 inch guns. Now for context, the background image of this video at the moment is the Italian cruiser Pisa, which is in fact armed with the Ellswick supplied 10 inch 45 caliber guns, as would have been fitted to design 375. However, they probably would have been Vickers guns, but we won't talk about that right now. Now, what's interesting is 375 would actually be half the displacement of a Pisa class armoured cruiser, which gives you an idea of just how small this battleship was going to be. So, with Design 375 not being taken up, an opportunity would arise elsewhere, and in fact, this time, it would arise in Italy with one of the Pisa-class armoured cruisers having gone up for sale, as the Italians were facing some financial difficulties and wouldn't be able to fund the completion of the ship. So, sensing a way to get hold of a powerful warship to counter Ottoman naval build-ups, the Greeks would pay for this vessel, but to a modified design, landing a one-third payment for said vessel of 300,000 gold, which in today's money, adjusted for inflation, would be about £29,862,064.53p. The gentleman who paid for this ship was named Georgius Azarov. Now I don't think I need to give an introduction to this ship, and yes there will be a video on this ship coming up very soon, but she became the flagship of the Royal Hellenic Navy and was more powerful than any vessel in the Ottoman fleet to date. So Azarov would eventually commission into the Royal Hellenic Navy in 1911, but by this point, things inside Greece were changing and the Ottomans were most definitely responding to this new vessel. So between 1910 and 1911, when Georgius Azarov was being launched and fitted out, the Ottomans went to their friends, the German Empire, and they asked to buy some ships. Of course, the Germans said, yeah, and sold them two pre-dreadnought battleships in the form of the two latter vessels of the Brandenburg class with both Weissenberg and Krufs Friedrich Wilhelm being sold to the Ottomans as the Turgit Ries and the Barbaros Hydroden. I think that's how you say it. Now, you might be looking at these acquisitions and wondering why are they buying pre-dreadnoughts at the opening stages of the Super Dreadnought era? Well, good question, glad you asked. Well, for starters, it was a way to one-up the Greeks. Second of all, Germany was in a naval arms race with the UK, and they were starting to get rid of their early pre-dreadnoughts, so they're basically surplus to requirement. And three, these ships could, and I put quotations, could, outgun and outmatch the Georgius Azarov, giving the Ottomans a gun power advantage in the Aegean Sea. Now the Ottomans were also looking to buy two dreadnought battleships, and they would go to the UK. Now they would order the two Rezadaya class dreadnoughts, and these would seriously outgun any vessel in the Greek Navy. 
and would give naval dominance to the Ottomans. So in 1911, the order was submitted for two Rezidaya class, and Rezidaya, the lead ship, would be built by Vickers in Barrow. And Hull too, Fatah Sultan Mahmed was planned to be built by Armstrong Whitworth in Newcastle. Now Rezidaya would be laid down in December 1911, which meant the Ottomans were ahead in the race to get a dreadnought battleship. Now to counter the new threat, the Greeks had to change a few things. First of all, the constitution was modified to allow naval experts to be hired from foreign countries to help in the rearmaments program. Now in steps the naval superpower that is the British Empire, and we suggested a few upgrades to naval infrastructure, as well as advising them on naval redevelopment, as well as guiding them to build a powerful super dreadnought. So in early 1912, Greece put out a tender and their design process began, originally citing a battle cruiser design, but would have the limit of 13,000 tonnes, which was the maximum weight limit for the floating dry dock at the Piraeus naval base. So now Greece would go to the shipbuilding companies Vickers of Barrow and Armstrong of Newcastle to design them a ship. Vickers would come up first, and they'd go for a smaller design again, with design 380, which was an alternative design to their previous design 375 from 1908. However, design 380 would now be 400 feet long and displace 8,150 tonnes, being armed with four 10-inch 45 calibre guns and an assortment of 10 6-inch 50s and two submerged torpedo tubes. The armament and length and displacement does give me Pisa class cruiser vibes, which is probably what they were going for. Now Vic has also tendered a design 381, which would change the secondary armament from 10 6 inch guns to 4 6 inch and 10 4 inch mounts. It's no surprise that this design didn't really go further and it would fail to win the competition. Now it's time for Armstrong to step in, and they would actually give some pretty credible designs, and quite a lot of them at that. So the first design was design 724, and this was produced on November 29th, 1911. Now this design had six 12 inch guns, 12 four inch guns, six six pounders, four three pounders, two 18 inch torpedo tubes, all in a displacement for 11,750 tonnes. No dimensions and speeds were given, but this does sound very similar to a pre-dreadnought. Now a slightly altered version of this design was design 724 Alpha, and this included a fixed gun angle reloading system. Design 726 was heavier at about 12,370 tonnes, however, nothing actually indicates why there was an increase in tonnage, but I'm giving you the numbers here. Design 727 was slightly lighter at 11,850 tonnes, mounting four 14 inch guns and changing the torpedo tubes from 18 inches in diameter to 21 inches. Design 728 was heavier again at 13,800 tonnes and mounting three turrets now of six 14 inch guns, as well as keeping the usual 21 inch torpedo tubes. Design 730 was slightly lighter but increased the gun calibre but removed a turret to four 15 inch guns, 12 4 inch guns, and two 21 inch torpedo tubes. Design 731 would be slightly heavier at 12,800 tonnes, but slightly decreased the gun calibre, but added another gun turret to have six 13.5 inch guns, most likely the Royal Navy's standard 13.5 inch dual gun turrets, which were currently in the fleet on their super dreadnoughts. Design 735 would be again larger at 13,500 tonnes, on a hull that was about 477 feet long, a beam of 76 feet, 
and a draft of 26 feet 6 inches. Armament would have been 8 12 inch guns in twin turret, located in an A, B, X, Y configuration on a flush deck hull. Similar to what we would have seen in the final Salamis design. But obviously, of course, with smaller guns. Secondary guns would have been 12 4 inch guns, 8 6 pounders, 4 3 pounders, and the usual assortment of two 21 inch submerged torpedo tubes. This time, there was mention of armour, and the belt armour would be 8 inches thick over the main quote-unquote citadel of the ship. Design 736 would have been slightly different, but the overall aspects of 735 would stay the same. However, in the source, not really much else is mentioned about this design. Design 738 would bring the weight down to tip 13,000 tons on a hull 462 feet long, beam of 76 feet, and a draft of 26 feet 6 inches. This design would now be armed with 14 inch twin guns in three turrets, located in A, Q, and Y configuration, as you can probably see on screen now. However, this is not actually the Armstrong design. According to the source, these guns would have been located on an A, Q turret on the forecastle, they quote forecastle deck, and Y turret would have been on the upper deck. Now reading between the lines, A and Q turret would have been on an upper deck, so that is the top weather deck, and Y turret would have been on the dropped quarter deck. Now the speed is mentioned as 21 knots, and the armour would be 8 inches on the belt. Now the final designs that they would also come up with, were in the regions of 12 to 14,000 tons, would be 743, with a displacement of 13,000 tons on a 488 foot long hull, armed with six 14 inch guns in an A, Q and X configuration. Secondary guns would have been eight 6 inch guns and a belt of 9.2 inches, speed of 21 and a half knots. Now I'm gonna mention here that in 1913, Armstrong would also offer a slightly larger ship, but by that point, Salamis had actually been ordered, and it really wouldn't actually fit with the overall story. So I'm just going to say it here. So this design would have been about 18,500 tons on a hull 536 feet long, beam of 83 feet, and a draft of 26 feet 6 inches. Armament would have been six 15 inch guns in an AQY arrangement, eight 6 inch guns, eight 3 inch guns, four submerged 21 inch torpedo tubes protected by nine inches armour over the magazines and machinery spaces, and again, speed would have been rated about 21 and a half inches. Now, looking at the overall arc of these designs, there were some really good designs. And there was also some pretty awful designs. But Greece decided against all of them, citing Armstrong's designs to have been more expensive than any other shipyard. And they did favour the Vickers design. However, Vickers would eventually drop out of the design stages and it all basically stagnated. So in June 1912, Greece would contract Germany to build them two destroyers and six torpedo boats. Now the destroyers would be the XSMS V5 and V6, V6 being on screen now, and the torpedo boats would become the Igli class torpedo boats. I think I said that right. Anyway, all these ships would be ordered from AG Vulcan in Statin, which is nowadays Poland. Now these were done quickly, and not really much money was spent during this contract because some of the ships were already on the slipways. Now in July, likely part of the contract for these small ships, AG Vulcan's Hamburg shipyard was chosen to build the Greeks' new battle cruiser. With the hull being built in Germany, the armour and the guns would be ordered from Bentham Steel in the USA. Now a small political bout would happen to come about between Germany, Greece and the British, with the Brits complaining that apparently 
the Germans were subsidizing the cost for the ship to get a foothold in the export of shipbuilding. And then the Greeks come back and saying, wow, you're inflating the armor prices. Me, 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 me. So welcome to the lovely, lovely subject of politics. Great. So now after 20 minutes and 22 seconds, we can now finally talk about the first design for the battleship Salamis. Now, initially off the bat, she definitely has a German look about her, but does take inspiration from Armstrong's design 728. She would be 140 meters long, 22 meters in beam, and sit 7.2 meters in the water. The length to beam ratio would be about 6.361, and for comparison, SMS Koenig had a length to beam ratio of 5.95 and she was the contemporary dreadnought at the time. The contemporary battle cruiser at the time was the design of the Deflinger at 7.26. Now, as you can see, the lower the number, the more chonky the ship would be. So, the higher the number, the more streamlined the ship would be. And as you can tell, she's definitely more battleship than battle cruiser. So, that's not great for her. Now let's talk about the spicy end of the ship. The main gun battery of the ship would have all been three 14-inch 50 caliber Mark I guns, the same found on New York and Texas, all located on a upper deck on the center line, located in A, Q, and X arrangements. The secondary armament would have been eight casement 6 inch 50 caliber Mark II guns located on the battery deck, or two deck, just below the upper deck. Eight 3 inch guns located in casements in the superstructure. Four 1.5 inch guns located in open mounts. And two 18 inch torpedo tubes located aft of X turret's barbette, offset port and starboard. The power plant would have been split between the amidships turret, with the forward fire room located below the forward funnel and superstructure, and the after fire room and main engine room located under the aft funnel and superstructure. She would have been fitted with two steam turbines, powering two shafts for about 21 knots. A pretty pedestrian speed at the time on the levels of US standard class battleships, but she would have been the same speed as Reza Dyer. Information on the armour is a little bit difficult to ascertain at this time, but it does appear that she would have followed the main German layout of an extended belt of around 50mm forward and aft of the main belt, with the main belt being in the regions of about 9-ish inches, thinned down to just below 4 inches at the waterline. The barbettes and the turret faces would have been about 9.85 inches, and the decks were actually quite thick at about 2.9 inches. So overall, belt armor, not great. Deck armor, pretty good going actually. Now over the rest of 1912, revisions would be made to the design. Now at the same point, tensions were rising in the Balkans and eventually the first Balkans conflict would break out, seeing the Balkans and the Greeks going up against the Ottomans in what would technically be their second to third conflict in about 20 years. Now, the takeaways from this conflict and the subsequent naval operations that the Greeks undertook re made the Greeks realize that a larger ship would be better for them. Now, during this period as well, the South American dreadnought race was starting to slow down and one of the nations was going to have to sell one of their dreadnoughts because at the time, the naval arms race was bankrupting some countries. Everyone's bets were on Argentina, and they thought they would be having to sell what would become the battleship Monroe, which was being built in America. The idea being, if the Greeks bought Monroe, she was under construction anyway, she would arrive faster. So instead, because they weren't selling Monroe, the Greeks would go back to AG Vulcan and the Salamis would have to be redesigned to the design that we know of today.
In December 1912, the final design for the battleship Salamis would be drawn up. She would be a 19,500 ton super dreadnought battleship armed with four twin 14 inch 45 calibre Mark I guns on a hull that measured 569 feet long 11 inches, a beam of 81 feet and a draft of 25 feet. In metric measurements, that is 173.71 metres long, a beam of 25 metres and a draft of 7.6 metres. Looking at the rest of the armament, her secondary weapons would have been 12 American 6 inch 50 Mark VI naval guns in casements, 12 American 3 inch 50 Mark V guns in casements, and 5 submerged 21 inch torpedo tubes. Yes, I said that correctly, five. One in the bow and two per broadside. Looking at the propulsion system, she would be powered by 18 coal-fired boilers producing steam that fed three steam turbines propelling the ship for a theoretical top speed of 23 knots. Survivability. She would have been internally subdivided into roughly 12 watertight compartments with her machinery and boilers being divided into three separate sections, with the forward boiler room situated under the forward funnel, the aft boiler room would have been below the aft funnel, and the turbines would have been aft of the aft funnel, with the outboard turbines being abreast of X turret, and the central shaft and its turbine would have been located under Y turret. She would have an inherent design flaw with her forward torpedo flat, being a large compartment in the bow, which all German vessels fitted with a torpedo in the bow would have. For reference, look at the SMS Lutzau at the Battle of Jutland to understand the reasons for that. So Salamis would be ordered in late December 1912, but wasn't actually laid down until July 23rd, 1913. Whilst the keel plates, ribs were being forged, set and erected, Bentham was starting to cast and bore out the barrels for their 14 inch guns. Now touching back on the South American dreadnought race, in October 1913, the Brazilian dreadnought Rio de Janeiro was put up for sale, and every country from Britain to Germany to Russia, Italy, Greece and the Ottomans were interested in buying this 12 inch turret farm of a warship. Now, with loads of deals and counter deals going on, the Ottomans would swoop in and buy the battleship. This seriously flipped the balance of power to the Ottoman side, and the Greeks started to press AG Vulcan to get Salamis to be finished as fast as possible. But she wouldn't have been finished before mid 1915. Now realising the issue, Greece turned to France wanting to buy two Breton class dreadnoughts to support Salamis and have full hull parity with the Ottomans. Two ships were ordered, the Vasilev Konstantinos and an unnamed second vessel. However, ship one would be laid down on the 12th of July 1914 and the second ship wouldn't even get to keel laying before Serbia ordered the full mobilisation during the July crisis, in the wake of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Technically, this was the start of what would become the Great War or the First World War. Now seeing that conflict was most definitely on the horizon, Greece would also buy two pre-dreadnoughts from the United States in the forms of the ex-USS Mississippi and Idaho, being named Kilkis and Lemnos. However, respectively, this was very questionable, but on paper, it would give the Greeks two battleships in one form or another. On August 4th, 1914, the German Empire then commenced the Schlieffen Plan, which aimed to invade France, going through Belgium. Now, due to treaties between Britain and Belgium, the British Empire stepped in, and a full-blown world conflict then started to ensue. And that was a very brief 
idea of the events that happened in mid-1914 for context, as it is a little bit more complex to understand. But let's go back to the battleship Salamis. So when war was declared, Salamis was still on the slipway, and she was about four months away from being launched. Now, before she was even launched in November 1914, the Royal Navy enacted a naval blockade of Germany, meaning no ships were going in or out. And this was an issue for Salamis, as her guns and armour hadn't actually been shipped from America yet. And by all accounts, the Greeks hadn't actually paid for the weapons in full yet. Seeing this issue and not being able to ship the guns, the guns went up for sale. And Sir Winston Churchill stepped in and said, Oh yes! And the guns would be shipped to the UK. And a class of four monitors would be built around them. These being the Abercrombie class monitors. But that is definitely a story for another day. Launch day arrived for Salamis on November 11th, 1914. Where she was launched stern first from slipway number two into the River Elbe. Unfortunately, there was no pomp and there was no ceremony, with a few onlookers watching and a few tugboats ready to take the ship. Post-launch, she would be taken under tow from tugboat and moved alongside the dolphins at Ross Quay, where she would remain for a number of years. Now unfortunately, due to the lack of steel, with the steel being put into German warships and then subsequently the U-boat arm of the German Kaiserliche Marine, she wouldn't be completed. And due to the guns not getting delivered, she was basically left an incomplete hulk for the duration of the First World War. Now attempts and studies were conducted by the shipyard and the German Navy to see if she could actually be completed and brought into service with the Kaiserliche Marina. But due to the 14 inch guns, the barbettes and the shell handling systems that would have gone into it, it wouldn't have been worth it. Looking post-war, it was unlikely that the ship would ever be finished especially as the Ottomans never actually got their ships, as the British seized them, and essentially they would be obsolete by the end of the war. And Salamis would also be obsolete by the end of the war, and the Greeks refused to accept the incomplete hulk. On the other side of it, however, the Germans technically couldn't finish the ship due to articles of the Treaty Versailles, limiting them to only be able to build merchant vessels, not ships of war. Now this actually sparked a dispute between the Greek naval command and AG Vulcan, because the Greeks wanted their money back from the period of construction that occurred before war broke out. And of course, AG Vulcan were like, nah, 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 you paid us, we've built you a ship, so take it or leave it. And this ensued for a couple of days and months, and years, and then options, luckily enough, were considered for a modernisation and a modernised design for roughly the end of the 1920s. But AG Vulcan's proposal didn't actually meet Greek requirements, and so the modernised design was shelved, leading to more years of back and forth between the shipyard and the Greek naval command and government. In the closing years of the 1920s, the Greeks determined that a fleet of destroyers 
and a naval air arm would be more effective and less costly than completing the battleship. In addition, Kilkis and Lemnos would be ample defence against the Turkish battlecruiser Yavuz, which had changed nationalities in the opening days of the First World War from German to Ottoman, and now technically Turkish. But that is a story for a different day. With the Great Depression ravaging the world's economies, it was decided to get rid of salamis. Now, Greece's economy couldn't technically handle keeping salamis, and finishing her would have just put them into even more debt. So, they paid £30,000, or £1,776,603.84 pennies in today's money, adjusted for inflation, to AG Vulcan, which was the outstanding amount. And then she would be sent for scrapping in Bremen. She would ultimately cease to exist by the end of 1932. Now, as you can probably tell, this is not the end of the video. And I raised the question of what would the ship have looked like if she was finished and the First World War hadn't broken out until she was commissioned? Well, ladies and gentlemen, here she is. The battleship Salamis. Now, as you can probably tell, this is not the end of the video. And I raised the question of what would the ship have looked like if she was finished and the First World War hadn't broken out until she was commissioned? Well, ladies and gentlemen, here she is. The battleship Salamis. Thank you for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed, if so give the video a like and a comment letting me know what you thought and if there's anything I can improve or if anyone wants to help out with the rendering because I'm a one man band, I'm not the best with Unreal Engine 5 but hey ho, we live and we learn so if you want to give a hand please let me know. As always I'm James Phillips, I'll catch you later guys, bye bye.